Okay, so welcome everyone to this evening's um, Southeast London training session and MEX peer review. We have Mr. James McHugh, consultant ophthalmologist at King's College Hospital uh, and at Queen Mary's. He's our consultant neuro ophthalmologist who's going to be talking to us today about neuro ophthalmology. Um, if I can get everyone to stay on mute unless they have to contribute to the, the teaching session uh, and I'll pass you over to Mr. McHugh now. Hi there. Yeah, I'm, I'm very keen for people to chip in with contributions and suggestions and questions. Um, if that seems to be running away with us, then maybe we'll have to go back to a more didactic system, but I'm quite keen for people to chip in as and when. Right, so um, I'm going to concentrate mostly on optic disc and optic nerve stuff, because that's deal, that's most of my job. Um, let's try and move through these slides. So optic nerves, so pseudopapilledema. I'm starting with the commonest thing, because... Um, swollen looking discs are a lot more common than actually swollen discs and then amongst swollen discs we'll cover papilledema and ischemic optic neuropathies and neuritis and I'll also mention atrophic discs and I'm going to do some neurological field defects I forgot to mention those and then if there is time I'll also cover some pupils and nystagmus a bit but those are huge topics so I can't really cover those in any detail so um, I'm going to start off with pseudopapilledema because this is this is the the thing which generates by far the greatest amount of work for us. So here's a normal disc. Any suggestions? What's going on with this disc? Why do I think it looks swollen? Or why is it going to get referred to me as question mark swollen? One okay. of the edges looks perhaps slightly blurred edges look slightly raised and blurry yeah and the reason yeah it does and it's because it's a really tiny disc this is a swell uh, this is a crowded disc crowded discs with no cups always look a bit swollen um and they're often a little bit lifted up if you look at them in profile on oct they're often a little bit elevated so a small disc i mean a disc is, is noticeably small if it's less than about one and a half millimeters and it has no cup what about this one? We get lots of these referred as well. Looks a bit. This tilted. looks like it's uh, tilted. Yeah, this is a, this is a really this is a really I've, I've taken an extreme example. This is a really tilted disc. Uh, so obviously that's that's classically it's myopes. They've got a long globe. The optic nerve enters the globe obliquely, and so one side uh, is lifted up relative to the retina, and the other side is depressed. And it's usually the nasal side which is lifted up or the supranasal side. It doesn't have to be. Occasionally you get them tilted kind of the wrong way and it'll be the temporal side that's lifted up, but it's usually the nasal side. And they'll quite often have some peripillary atrophy on the downhill side. And then the last one, let's get these places out of the way. Uh, the last one, what's that? It looks like drusen of the optic nerve. Yeah. So this is really florid distrusion, lots of glassy lumps in a strange lumpy looking disc. Uh, so those are crystals of material that are getting extruded by the axons. Um, you develop drusen when you're a child and it largely or almost entirely happens in people with small optic discs. And I'm sure that's involved in how it develops. And if the drusen are really deeply buried, particularly in, in younger children, it's incredibly hard to spot them. In fact, you can't. You can't spot really deeply buried drusen with a sit lamp. Um, and that's the problem that the disc just looks swollen. So um, I, we use OCT a lot. We, OCT is our number one medium for working out whether a disc is normal or not. So this is a slice, a profile through an optic disc. You can see the on fast picture on the left and then the slice on the right. So what's going on here? Um, maybe just bunching of nerve fibers before yeah. leaving the it's it's a and uh, yes it's a small disc and it's a tilted disc as well okay and you've got this distinctive profile so it's as a zigzag profile and then the canal which should go on oct should go straight backwards you know downwards towards the bottom of the screen it doesn't go downwards it goes obliquely that's not normal that's a sign of tilt so this is a tilted disc uh and you've also got a little bit of peripapillary atrophy on the the downhill side the temporal side and you can see that on the OCT is a sort of bright, uh, bright signal there because the light is able to penetrate through the atrophic area. 
And these are Drusen. This is Drusen caused a lot of confusion. And if you look at the old, uh, the original papers about this Drusen, um, they were wildly inaccurate. But now we know that Drusen look like this on an OCT. Drusen are dark things on an OCT with a bright surrounding cortex. So they are black crystals. The reason they're black is because they don't reflect any light because they're transparent. Um, and they have a bright calcified uh, cortex around them. So that's the characteristic look of a drusen. And then they have these pale shadows. They're pale because unlike vessels, which block light uh, from the OCT, these transmit the light. So the, they actually have a pale shadow, a negative shadow around them. Um, so these, this is how you can tell a druse from a vessel because some, otherwise they can look quite similar. Um, and you often get these little tiny um, bright spots around large druses, and those are baby druses that haven't uh, haven't developed into a, a decent uh, central uh, um, clear area. Okay, Jim, so sorry, can I just ask you, Jim? Sorry, hmm. on, on the last one, the knobbly bits at the top. What are those due to then? That there, can you see yes. my pointer? Those yes. are vessels. They're just vessels. Okay. Vessels, uh, vessels can look exactly like a druse. Um, but these are these are arteries. They have a sort of they, they often have like an hourglass inside them, and then their their shadow is somewhat darker. You can see when you go into this drusen, it's a certain amount of brightness there, and then it gets darker when it's beneath the uh, the vessel. These aren't great pictures, honestly, I, the, but they were the best ones I could find uh, in a hurry. Um, I've got better ones elsewhere. But that's those are vessels. Okay, so distrusion, I, I used to just discharge them, but uh, there's a new, the new paradigm of distrusion is that we monitor them and we decide whether they need uh, glaucoma drops. Usually they don't. Uh, and honestly, the evidence that it makes any difference is a bit meagre, but uh, if everyone else is doing it, I'm going to do it too. So we, we now monitor distrusion. All other pseudopapilledema, we don't need to worry about it. The question is, is it pseudopapilledema? That's, that's the million dollar question usually. Uh, and so we do have virtual clinics for checking them um if you get worried um so we can talk about that later so so if you are now monitoring disc drusen is yeah. that something you want to monitor at hospital or some oh, i'd be really happy for you to do it for me <laughs> um, so do you want us to refer in distrusion? So up until now, we've been... Well, mm, that's a good question. Okay, um, people usually do. Okay, people usually do because they want to be sure that it is just drusen and it's not swollen. And occasionally you get both, not very often. Um, if you are confident it's distrusion and, and there's no reason for thinking there's anything else, then yeah, I'm quite happy to. Um, I think... And then, and then I would just see them once a year. And if they're clearly progressing, which is unusual... You know, in terms of fields or in terms of the nerve fibre layer thinning, or if their pressure goes above 21 rather than say 25, um, I would start thinking about lowering the pressure with some drops. So, but none of that, I mean, Drusen often appear in clinic, you know, when they're in their 20s or 30s uh, or, or as children. And frankly, you're not likely to get higher pressure until considerably later in life. So it's not, it's not actually that common that we have to do anything. I'd be happy for you to, I'm happy for you to follow it up if you're happy to follow it up. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so papilledema. So papilledema is swollen discs and it's specifically swollen discs due to high pressure. Any other cause of swollen discs, we don't call papilledema in Britain. Um, and by far and away the com commonest cause is hormonal factors. Um, they are, you know, I have lots of patients, patients with papilledema and about 80 to 90% of them have IIH, but you also get blocked veins in the head and blocked ventricles or large solid tumours. They they tend to, I tend to meet them only after they've had emergency surgery. Um, so there's lots of causes and you can't just assume it's idiopathic intracranial hypertension, but usually it is. It's usually bilateral, but it doesn't have to be because if you've got a small disc or a tilted disc, it'll swell much more easily and that can lead, lead to being very asymmetrical. Most patients with high enough pressure to swell up their discs will get headaches, but unfortunately not everyone, which is a bit of a problem. Um, they will frequently have pulse, pulsation in their ears, like they can hear their own pulse going whoosh, whoosh, whoosh in their ears. That's like in the context of thinking, is this a swollen disc? That's a dead giveaway that it is a swollen disc due to high pressure and their vision varies. 
So people with mild pressure related disc swelling will have no visual symptoms of any kind. If it's moderate, they might have this appearance. What's, what's going on with these fields? Could it increase in the blind spot, sir? Yeah, that's right. Uh, and it's just a straightforward, nothing's been damaged, but a disc that is swollen can't see properly. So you get an enlarged, the discs physically have a, a large cuff of edema around them and that area can't see properly. And then if it's really bad, you get something that looks like that, you know, tunnel vision or complete wipeout in the worst cases, uh, like, like really severe glaucoma. Uh, and you can also have a, another characteristic feature, visual feature of really bad disc swelling is that when they bend over, their vision completely blacks out for a second or two, but it's very, very brief. It is literally a second. And that's a sign of a disc that's on its, it's clinging on with its fingertips to its perfusion. It's really badly perfused. It's dreadfully swollen. Uh, and even the slight change in pressure from bending over is enough to compromise the circulation for a few seconds. So it's a very bad sign if they start saying they, they lose vision for a second or two when they bend over. Uh, but that only happens with really bad disc swelling. You don't get it with mild disc swelling. Sorry, I and should then, ask, can I ask a question? The headaches, um, yeah. would you, do you agree that they're still worse when they're lying down? Is that still a... Accepted often but I, I see i don't think i mean yes there is such a thing as a sort of raised pressure phenotype like classically the headaches are worse online down but i see an enormous number of people with high pressure who don't have headaches fitting that phenotype they'll often have what are quite obviously migraines and their migraines have got a lot worse recently and yes they have massively swollen discs but they still sound exactly like regular migraines so i don't think you can really tell and I know that most of my colleagues, for example, um, Jan Hoffman, who's a headache specialist who I work with, who's done a lot of work on IH, you can't easily tell from somebody's history whether the headaches are high pressure or not, frankly. It's really difficult. So um, there are freezing grades. I have to say I don't use them very much because now that we have OCT, we're not reliant on carefully grading things to see if people are getting better or worse. Um, but these are the freezing grades. So you start off with... Um, oh, just leave it out there. Sorry, my children. Um, you start off with uh, a cuff on the nasal side of the disc, which looks an awful lot like some kinds of pseudopapal edema. In fact, they're really, really similar. Um, and then as it gets worse, that halo goes around the entire disc. That's more suspicious. And then you start to get segments of vessels being covered up uh, just off the disc. And then it's slightly worse if it's on the disc. Uh, and then you don't have any cup, uh, and then you start to get hemorrhages, which is always a bad sign because it means damage is occurring. And then the worst disc, this is a really bad freezing five disc. Um, hemorrhages and common spots are not part of the freezing grading system, uh, but they're always a bad sign. If you start to see a swollen disc with hemorrhages and common spots, it's always an extremely bad sign that it's a disc in terrible trouble. Whether it's papilledema or an AION or something like that, it's suffered a lot of damage. Um, so you need to do something urgently about it. So the number one tool to decide if a disc is genuinely swollen or not and to monitor it is OCT. Uh, and the most useful of all the different sequences you can do on the OCT, the most useful one by far is a straightforward glaucoma OCT like this. Um, so you just circle around the disc and it's unwrapped there. And I spent a lot of time looking at these, you looking at the actual raw image. And the nerve fiber layer is the top layer, it's the pale, sort of slightly more granular looking layer on the surface. Often OCTs aren't very good at segmenting layers, particularly if the disc is swollen, they get it hopelessly wrong quite often. Um, and so you have to, well, ideally you correct it yourself, that is a bit of a faff, frankly. Um, and then you'll show you on a graph how that person's disc compares to the normal range. And then it'll usually display it as some kind of traffic light as well. And then the graph and the traffic light will both be affected if there are uh, artifacts that haven't been corrected. They can be wildly wrong. But what's really useful about this is it kind of doesn't matter does, whether the disc sticks up a little bit or whether it looks a bit odd, because if the nerve fiber layer is completely non-thickened, then it's not a, you know, a papilledema disc. It's not a swollen disc in the conventional sense. The really swollen discs, the nerve fiber layer is so thick and it is off the scale, uh, off, you know, literally off the top of the screen in some cases. If it is a normal, if the nerve fiber layer is within normal limits, you don't need to worry about it being a really swollen disc. It's not going to be. Uh, and it's immensely helpful. Now, every really swollen disc started off as a normal disc and for a while will have looked within the normal limits. But nonetheless, it's very reassuring. So 
it's perhaps best to think of it as a kind of spectrum from normal to uh, possibly normal, not quite sure, to no, this is definitely not normal, to horribly swollen, nasty looking discs. Um, I'm just going to move, I've got your faces displayed over half the screen, I'm just going to get rid of them for the moment. Um, so, and then if the if the OCT is literally off the page, it's a big problem. That means you've got a horribly swollen disc. So don't please don't write in and say, you know, disc margin is a bit blurred. That's the sort of thing that needs to be dealt with kind of the same day, ideally, or within a few days. So if it's really bad swelling, or if it's kind of milder swelling, but they have really bad symptoms implying that something new is going on that's trying to get worse, the best bet is high casualty. It's much safer than any other way of dealing with it. Uh, they go, they see a doctor, and from the moment they see them, that's their responsibility, and they will deal with it appropriately. And that will usually mean sending them off to a &E for lumbar punctures and CT scans the same day. If it's kind of equivocal, then it might be suitable for our virtual clinic. Uh, we have them at St Thomas's and at Sidcap and also at King's. Um, we're still kind of negotiating how you guys book into them, but um, they are they are there. But at the moment, if you can't see the virtual clinics listed on ERS, then just refer it to my casualty and they're used to booking into the virtual clinics, so they'll do it for you. OK, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, very common. And it's a characteristic history of sudden visual loss, and they usually wake up with it. It's older people as a rule. The great majority are not from temporal arteritis, they are non-arteritic, and they're caused by a combination of small optic nerves that are readily swollen and will lose their blood supply if they get a bit swollen, and also filled up arteries and high blood pressure, high cholesterol, things like anemia and sleep apnea, uh, very common. Only about 10% are due to temporal arteritis, but the reason we worry about that is because that's like, Almost, I would actually say that is the worst condition in ophthalmology, temporal arteritis. Uh, it's the one thing where from no symptoms at all to complete irreparable blindness in both eyes can be measured in hours to a few days. Um, you really can't miss it. So that's what we'll worry about. But gentile arteritis pri primarily affects white people. It is pretty unusual in any other ethnic group. And they are always old. Uh, it does not affect young people. They usually have tender temples. Sometimes they're visible like this, but normally if you can see somebody's vessels on their temple, actually it's just their veins because they've got tight muscles, uh, but they're tender is the key thing. Uh, and it's really suspicious if they, when they eat, their jaw builds up more and more ache as they eat. And then when they stop, it wears off again. That's a sign of, uh, or their tongue, that's a sign of uh, jaw or tongue muscles that are not getting enough blood supply. They often feel sort of feverish and ill uh and lost their appetite and they're a real they're a real emergency they need to go to a and e and they need massive doses of steroids even though they're typically little old ladies they need prodigious doses of steroids because that way you're you're preventing them from losing vision in both eyes and sometimes we miss it unfortunately because it's easily missed so anterior ischemic optic neuropathy here's a typical aion field defect so you uh well could anyone describe it for me I've only shown you one eye. Let's say the other eye is completely normal. It's altitudinal. Yes. So it's typically altitudinal or as a broad arcuate, uh, except in giant cell arteritis, where typically you just lose everything. Um, and that's an acute swollen disc. That's what it looks like on an OCT. It's swollen. The nerve fibre is substantially above normal. If it's not swollen, so it stays swollen for ages. And if you get an elderly patient or a patient coming in and they've recently lost vision and you think it might be an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, but if the disc is not swollen, it isn't. It's always really swollen for, for, for a prolonged period of time. Uh, so you, you should, um, if you don't see that swelling, then either they've got their dates wrong, completely wrong, or it's some other pathology. This is what they look like a few months or a few years later. Um, what's going on with this disc? Uh, it's a bit pale superiorly. Yes, that's right. It's that, and it's specifically that superior pallor, which is characteristically vascular. You know, the, the blood supply of the eye typically divides into a top half and a bottom half. And with an AION, frequently both halves are involved, but often one half will be much worse affected than the other. So you'll get a, a pallor that respects this altitudinal pattern. Not many other things do that. 
And that's what that same disc would look like on OC. It's not actually the same patient, but but uh, it's exactly how it would look on an OCT. Um, so I don't know if you can see, there's a complete flattening off of the superior part of the nerve fiber layer and the inferior part is just fine. So anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, if you think it should be GCA, could be GCA because it's, you know, has any features and they're the right age, uh, they need to go to casualty. No messing around with anything that could delay them. Any other acutely swollen disc that looks, you know, from its altitude near food deficit like an AION, they go to casualty because they're going to need a workup to make sure they don't, you know, really anemic or any other nasty. And um, we will check their bloods, bloods for all of them. And if you come across an altitudinal pallor that looks like it's been there forever and a, and a corresponding field defects, and you think it's probably been there for a really long time, I think it's still worth us checking them out. But it's that's routine, so we can see them in clinic um, via normal referral. Okay, optic neuritis. So that's inflammation of the optic nerve. 99% of optic neuritis is autoimmune. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not counting cases that were due to sinusitis, but in terms of, let's say, viral infection of the nerves, things like that, they're very unusual. I hardly ever see them, whereas I see neuritis the whole time. Um, it's, it's, it's characteristically younger patients. So over age 50, AION is common. Under age 50, neuritis is common. Typically, they start getting pain behind their eye. And because the optic nerve or nerve, nerve sheath technically is tender, it hurts to look around in different directions. And within a few hours, their central vision starts getting worse. They get a central scotoma, they get altered color vision in the affected eye. And the pain, it will typically, it varies, but it typically lasts about a couple of weeks and then disappears of its own accord. It doesn't go on, grumbling on for months and years. If somebody has pain for months or years, it isn't going to be neuritis because our neuritis just doesn't do that. Um, their vision usually improves rather more slowly than their pain it typically takes a good few months to get back to close to normal and it hardly ever gets back to 100 percent normal but often they'll have normal or nearly normal acuity and a field that's either normal or nearly normal but slightly iffy color vision it would be quite common and in terms of differential i mean one of the problems with optic neuritis is you're going largely on the history and an ropd because there's not normally a lot and you know there's not much science to confirm that you're right there are other things that can present this way. So, for example, that pain and eye movements, that is not unique to optic neuritis. Any problem with the front of the eyes, the corneal problems, things with the tarsal conjunctiva can hurt when you look around in different directions. The sclera hurts if you pull on it. So if the sclera is like if you get anterior scleritis or posterior scleritis, it will get pain, typically really severe pain with movements, but their vision will sometimes be normal. Uh, and in posterior sclerosis, the front of the eye can look completely normal. So it's very difficult to diagnose apart from the inordinate amount of pain they have. And then orbital myositis, where they have typically one, sometimes more than one muscle inflamed. And then when that muscle pulls, it hurts. You get pain behind the eye or movement in a, in a particular direction. And then there are all sorts of other conditions that don't have a pain or movement. They just have pain, pain around the eye. So most or many headaches, migraine, for example, is frequently perceived to be around the eye or sinusitis. There are many, many other pains around the eye that are not to do with the optic nerve um, and where you will see a normal looking slit lab exam. So. Uh, what's this field defect? I think it's a central scotoma. Yes, that's pretty typical. And then what's this field defect? Total. Yeah. So it's really hard when you when, when you're relying on a Humphrey field, you actually can't tell. This could easily be a central scotoma. I certainly see lots of patients with a, a central scotoma that looks like this because their their scotoma is bigger than 24 degrees. Uh, or 30 degrees or whatever and I mean in really bad neuritis you can have a you can have a central scotoma that's like you know 90 degrees uh it's immense but you still have a rim of peripheral vision and if you can pick it you can pick it up on confrontation or on a Goldman field so really bad you know complete blackout of the central field is kind of a bad sign in neuritis it's you know it's a sign that it's quite severe and then often you're left with something like this which I mean 
to me, I would call that a normal field. I know there's a couple of patches that aren't entirely right, but I consider this normal. It's quite common to have a normal field, you know, six months down the line. It's not that common to have a normal field when it's an acute problem, it's painful and the rest of it. It's, it's actually slightly unusual to have a completely normal field. And then the acuity varies anything. It's usually like six, nine or worse acutely. But I mean, occasionally you get people who have no light perception if it's if it's extremely severe. And obviously, if it's really bad, you have to worry a lot more uh, that, that that it's going to be something very destructive. The issue of color vision is usually reduced. They pretty much always have red desaturation. The only reason for not having red desaturation in neuritis is if it's bilateral or if you previously had it in the other eye. It, they almost always have some degree of red desaturation. If you show them a bright red object, it's just darker, duller, paler, not as bright. And assuming it's unilateral, which it usually is, they should have an RAPD, unless it's the mildest of mild neuritis. And it's quite common to have a little bit of disc swelling. About a third will have mild disc swelling. It's rare to have serious disc swelling. So triage, there's one special category and it's a rare condition. There's a rare condition called neuromyelitis optica, which is another sort of phobia condition for neuroophthalmologists. It's a, a really nasty, aggressive, destructive variant of optic neuritis. It's typically, it's often found in uh, teenagers and young adults most often with either an African or Afro-Caribbean background or, or mixed heritage. And um, it's so much worse than regular neuritis. They must, you know, if they, they can go from normal vision in the morning to no light perception at night, and it doesn't always come back. Um, so they need really, really aggressive treatment. They need to go straight into hospital. They need intravenous steroids the same day. And if that doesn't start to work within about 24 hours, we need to take all their blood out and, 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 and do plasma exchange. In other words, throwing out anything we can't identify and just keeping the cells. Um, they need the most aggressive of aggressive treatment. Um, you won't normally know they have neuromyelitis optica, but if someone tells you they have it, uh, and has wandered into your shop and helpfully tells you that they're starting to get pain and, oh, by the way, they have neuromyelitis optica, that should that should trigger alarm bells that they need to be in hospital immediately. Um, that said, they won't, I don't think they will usually turn up to opcoms, but, but they could do. Um, you know, people, people aren't always that sensible about about um, about who, who they seek help from in the first instance, because uh, it's not something you can handle. Um, they need to go straight to a &E, basically. Um, and if they're not... If they don't have a prior diagnosis, I would certainly be suspicious if someone had bilateral neuritis symptoms uh, or really, really bad vision, like light perception, no light perception or hand movement, something like that. Uh, and particularly if they were young and black, I'd be extremely concerned that it was this until proven otherwise. So that, that sort of thing should alarm you a great deal. And they should uh, there should be no time wasted, no faffing around with, with the Internet. Just just send, you know, send them straight over either to eye casualty or to A&E. Any other patient with neuritis, neuritis is something that's worth treating, even if it's quite mild. We usually treat it these days with some oral methylprednisolone. So um, send them to eye casualty. Um, if, if it's a chronic patient, I get quite a lot of chronic pain or pain behind the eye. It's been there for six months. I think it might be neuritis, please see, that kind of stuff. The answer is no, it isn't neuritis. Um, it's, not, it's never going to be neuritis, but it's clearly something that's a problem. Um, so... If it's an acute problem and you think it might be neuritis, as well, eye casualty. If it's a chronic grumbling problem that you think might be neuritis, it probably isn't, but we will see them anyway. But uh, that could that could be referred to clinic. Okay. Uh, pale discs. So discs can be pale in various ways, but the most important ways are number one, if they're swollen and pale. Number one, the GCA patient, the temporal arthritis patient, I already described, the little old ladies, new headache atrocious vision big swell and pale disc because it's just been infarcted that's that's an emergency they need to go to casualty and the other group of swell and pale discs are people who's had papilledema that hasn't been bad enough for them to seek help because they lost vision but it's been quite bad and it's grumbled on for months and years like freezing for you know fairly bad papilledema grumbling on and every time they've gone to the doctor they were told it was migraine uh, that happens quite often, and they can end up with very pale discs, but nonetheless surprisingly normal vision. But much more common is pale discs with no swelling. So old people have pale discs. 
If you see older patients and they've had a cataract operation, their disc will look kind of pale. And then you start wondering, is this abnormal? Um, do an OCT. If the OCT is normal, then it's a normal disc. Uh, if a nice normal nerve fiber layer is standard old age and you don't need to refer them or anything, it's just normal. Anything, any severe retinopathy, you know, if you've got really bad retinitis pigmentosa, you'll get a pale disc. If you have a central retinal artery occlusion or a branch retinal artery occlusion, you'll get a pale disc. Anything widespread, any widespread retinal destruction will give you a pale disc, but it should be pretty obvious in most cases. That said, retinal artery occlusions aren't always that obvious. They're sometimes quite hard to spot. Um, and then lastly, because any kind of optic nerve damage will give you a pale disc, and it's pale because it's inactive. Inactive discs don't need much perfusion, so they don't they don't draw it. They don't pull in enough blood because they don't have much metabolism to support. So that's why they go pale. And then you get these distinctive patterns, and I'm going to talk through it um, primarily with on an OCT basis because that tells you what's wrong with them. So um, if you saw this, now I don't normally I don't I don't approve of the traffic light circles on OCTs very much, but but just this is a really common picture. If you saw this pattern on an OCT, what would be the first thing you thought of? Okay, no one's volunteering that. Okay, glaucoma. Yeah, so that's that's that arcs arcs around the top of the macula, around the bottom of the macula are absolutely typical of early glaucoma. Very few other neuropathies do that. And then when you look at the disc, it's not pale; it's actually cupped. Okay, this one. This isn't the traffic light. This is the graph. It might look familiar um, from earlier. So, what pattern is this? Um, up and down altitudinal. Yes. There's a an appropriate looking disc. That's vascular. Right. What about this one? And in this one, you can actually see that it's you can actually see the the, the grey line is their original presentation, and the black line is their new graph. Uh, I, I captured this uh, a couple a few weeks ago. Um, they're only about two months apart. So what's what's the pattern? What what causes thinning in this location? The answer is lots of things. This is a really typical neuropathy location. So the middle of the temporal side, halfway through the temporal side, the bit that's pointing straight at the fovea gets thinned preferentially. That's what it might look like. So temporal pallor. That's actually, that, that temporal pallor is actually more severe than you'd expect for this OCT, but anyway. Um, because it's not the same person. I don't do colour photos on most of my patients. It's too much of a faff. I need to go to a different floor for that. So I'm afraid so I steal most of my colour photos for these presentations. Uh, right, so that's things like optic neuritis. Anything that causes central scotomas. So optic neuritis causes central scotomas, and so you get mid-temporal thinning. Hereditary neuropathy, things like labours, which is usually bilateral, though it'll end up being bilateral, or dominant optic atrophy, that's mid-temporal and temporal pallor and a central scotoma, and exactly the same for toxic neuropathies and, and particularly nutritional neuropathies, which are really common, folate uh, deficiency, B12 deficiency, uh, thiamine deficiency in alcoholics. These are really common. They're symmetrical, they're bilateral, and you get this mid-temporal uh, mid thinning. And, they, and every single one of these conditions is characterized by uh, central scotomas. Right, how about this one? I've made it easy for you. But the question is, what do we call it? And I could probably found a neater one, but so this is this is bow tie thinning. So bow tie thinning is what you get uh, from the from crushing the chiasm. You squash the chiasm, you squash the nasal fibres that are decussating the fibre, uh, the chiasm, this is the pattern you get. 
Uh, and you also get it if you have, you also get it on the contralateral side to a tracked lesion. Anything, anything where all the fibers cross over to the other side via the chiasm will get this pattern. And it's, it's, I tell you, it's an awful lot, because you know, I see these all the time, it's an awful lot easier to see the pattern on the OCT than it is in real life down the slit lamp. It's really difficult to say whether someone has bow tie thinning or bow tie pallor down the slit lamp. On an OCT, it's doddle. Okay. And then this is something, this is kind of the new kid on the bot when it comes to uh, neuro OCT. And this is my particular obsession is the macular ganglion cell layer. So that's the layer under the nerve fiber layer, which is the cell bodies of the optic nerve. Most people don't know how to segment it, but your system will have a, a system for segmenting the layers if it's a relatively modern system. And this is what it ought to look like. So this is a heat map. So you should have a thickened area of cell bodies around the fovea, and those are the cell bodies of the optic nerve. And what's great about the ganglion cell layer is it thins really quickly after injury, so you can tell that something's recent and you can pick up change very quickly. It's exquisitely sensitive. You will develop defects in this long before you develop a field defect. And the patterns are very intuitive and easy to understand. So this is what this is what the thickness ought to be like, something like 45 microns in most sectors, apart from temporally, where it's a little bit thinner. That's what it looks like. It's badly damaged. Uh, all sorts of neuropathies will cause that wipeout appearance. So here are some patterns, and I don't suppose you'll have seen these before, so there's not much point quizzing you on them. Okay, so this is an arcuate defect. So this patient has a superior arcuate thinning in their ganglion cell there, and they would have an inferior arcuate defect on their fields. So this is, this is what an arcuate defect looks like when it's printed onto your macula. So that's going to be either glaucoma or possibly a really tiny AION. What about this pattern? Any suggestions? So remember, it's, it's supposed to look like a yellow, it's supposed to look like a donut on a red plate, but here half of it's been eaten. Which half has been eaten? Nasal half or the temporal half? Nasal. Yeah. What's wrong with it? What what uh, what tumor does this patient have? Papular macular bundle. Yeah, but but where? Okay. Oh, let's 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 phrase that the exact opposite way. What field defect, if they're nasal maculas or atrophic, what field defect do they have? Temporal. Yes. Let's say both eyes look like this. Is it pituitary? Yes. This is characteristic look of a, pituitary, of a quite bad pituitary tumor. But this patient might have no field defect yet because you can get a macula that looks exactly like this before you develop any field defect at all. So with these days, the pituitary surgeons will operate based on an OCT like this. I mean, this is new. I, I, we, we had, I had to negotiate with them to accept this, but they will now operate on the basis of an OCT showing a convincing progressive problem, even if there's no field bars. Um, how about this one? What's this person's field defect? Um, missing... <laughs> lower field yes so what kind of what what uh, what neuro family problem do they have um a i o n yes exactly good now um the macular ganglion cell layer is is only a tiny amount of the retinal thickness so actually if this patient the one with the a o n if you look to their full macular map it would look pretty much normal or it would only very subtly abnormal. What about this new one on the right hand side? This person also has an altitudinal field defect. What's wrong with them? This is this is the full thickness macular map. Something's killed the upper. Yes. Upper half of that retina exactly retina. and it's and it neatly respects the horizontal midline this is a branch retinal artery occlusion 
So if you're, if you're, I mean, assuming you use the same color scale as me, if you, if you, if you can see the deep blue sea somewhere on the macula, macula, that's that means that the the whole retina has been killed off, or at least the whole inner retina. Um, you can't do that with neuroophthalmic problems. So that's that's a retinal artery occlusion. Right. So um, triage. If you think they've got temporal arteritis, a pale, swollen disc. Yeah, just remember, I've, I'm trying to hammer that point home. It's, it's really urgent. They need to go to A&E. Most other pale discs need to go to eye casualty if they've got some kind of symptom, something implying that it's not a really long-standing problem. And then lots of lots of people have long-standing pale discs, like, you know, you ask them, oh, I lost my vision in 1978, that kind of thing, uh, in that eye. That, you know, obviously that's not an emergency. Um, but if they have no idea why, it is possible that it might have a tumour that's been slowly marching onwards for 40 years. That's possible. So, you know, something long standing that's totally unexplained. It's not unreasonable to refer uh, for a routine checkup to find out what earth is going on. OK. Neurological field defects. And. Um, I have to say, I get an awful lot of referrals where the referrer has got confused about left and right and the fact that obviously field defects are shown from the patient's perspective, so that what looks like it's on the left is left and what looks like it's on the right is right, you know, as, as if the patient was looking at the page. So um, what's how what do we call this field defect? Right homonymous. Yes. Where is the lesion? What kind of area? It's be behind the chasm. Yes. Radiations. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, actually, tracts, amazingly, the tracts hardly ever, I mean, I've been, I've, I see like thousands, I see about 3,000 patients a year. I, I have hardly ever seen a patient with a tract lesion on its own. Um, so it'll either be occipital lobe, and if it's a really big field defect, it's quite often occipital lobe, because if you get a, because the amount of brain required to cause a field defect this size elsewhere is is really very extensive so uh it'll be either occipital or parietal and temporal and it'll be on the left side because it's a right-sided field defect um so if that's a uh, so strokes are really common so assume it's a stroke until proven otherwise i mean it could be a tumor which is usually even worse um and it could be abscesses and things like that but but just assume it's a stroke because it usually is What about this? Right superior quadrantinopia. Yep. Where's the lesion? Uh, left parietal. So it'll be parietal is up at the top of the visual pathways. And so that's at the top of the retina. So that's the bit that's looking down. So the parietal does uh, inferior field defects. The temporal lobe is, is the lower part of the visual pathway, the, the, the more inferior part, and it does the bottom of the retina, which is looking upwards. So uh, temporal lobe defects are up here, high in the sky, uh, and the parietal ones are down at the bottom, part on the floor. So this is a an upper right uh, homonymous quadrantinopia, but differential is the same. It's still going to be a stroke until proven otherwise. Right, how about this one? That's a bad temperament. It is. It's surprisingly rare. It's surprisingly rare to get a really neat bi temporal. Uh, but anyway, that's so that's the characteristic sign of your chiasm being damaged. And if the chiasm is damaged, it occasionally inflammatory, but it's usually getting crushed by something, either a pituitary tumor or a craniopharyngioma or a meningioma from above, something like that. Um, it's usually a tumour and it usually needs surgery. How about this one? That's an early uh, uh, pituitary tumour. Yes. Doing clockwise in the right and anti-clockwise in the left. Yes. That's exactly right. Okay. So, yes. So, um, well, yeah. So, um, I mean, strokes, obviously, they appear kind of the field defect of a stroke appears fully formed, more or less, in an instant. And they tend to be extremely dense as a rule. They tend not to be patchy. 
And tumor compression can be very dense, as in this bitemporal one, but it can also be quite subtle to start with. And so pituitaries will start off with relatively subtle, and because the pituitary is, the pituitary is underneath the chiasm, and when it expands, it needs to expand a lot before it touches the chiasm. I mean, it needs to be you know, massively greater than the normal size. Um, it rises up from underneath and starts squashing the lower fibers first. So you get an upper quadrant node that's very subtle indeed to start with. And then it gets denser and denser and denser. Um, but it does, and, and then it typically will actually then veer off to one side and will, and you'll get something which crosses the midline in one eye uh, and not in the other. Um, but by then it's usually very obvious that you've got nasty problems to deal with. So, yes, so homonymous defects. If somebody comes in and they say their vision has been very odd for, you know, two days, and you pick up a homonymous hemianopia, it's a stroke. And the thing about stroke is it is a medical emergency. We would only, they, so if a stroke, if a stroke gets to casualty within the first few hours, you know, if they've, if they've looked at the thing on the ambulance and they, they remember their FAST and they went straight to casualty, then they will try and uh, thrombolize them. They'll put in clot busting drugs. If they leave it longer than that, and, and those patients you won't meet, obviously. But if they leave it longer than that and maybe don't really fully understand what's going on and go to the optician and think, well, I need to get my eyes checked, then it can still be pretty urgent because there are other things apart from thrombolysis they can do. They will they will check, is, is this patient got a clot on their heart that's throwing off chunks of clot? Have they got a critical narrowing of their carotid artery? Uh, is there something funny going on with their blood? They do a whole lot of medical workup very, very quickly. They So they invariably get admitted to hospital. They do lots and lots of tests very quickly, find as many problems as they can as quickly as possible and put them on a whole load of medicines. Um, the idea being that if you do it really fast, you will actually prevent quite a lot of further strokes. You're never more likely to have a stroke than when you've just had one. Um, and that's the worry is that if there are any delays could be a problem. So strokes... Uh, honestly, if you're sure someone's just had a stroke, or if you think it's pretty likely because they've got an obvious stroke field defect and they don't know that they've had a, you know, nobody's told them, oh yeah, you had a stroke before. Uh, I would send them to A&E. That's where strokes should go. Um, you know, we don't deal with strokes in the eye department. Uh, if a stroke comes in, I mean, if somebody winds up in my clinic by some miracle who's just had a stroke, I will send them off to A&E. Um, because although I do see people who've had strokes, I see them much longer down the line and I do like high visual testing and things like that. Um, I'm, what I don't do is dash around um, working out what's wrong with their heart rhythm and thinning their blood and stuff like that, because that's just not my skill set. So they need to see someone who knows about those things. So it's a big uh, a neurologist or a care of the elderly physician. If it's someone who's known to have had a stroke and they've had all that medical workup, then actually we, we have orthoptists. We have orthoptists both at King's. Uh, I used to run a stroke clinic myself, but um, we now have orthoptists at King's and at Sidcup who do uh, the assessments and some exercises to improve their vision and things. If it's a bitemporal defect, unless it's, unless it's someone who's known to have had pituitary surgery years before, and even then, sometimes you're not sure, well, could it have recurred? Because they usually recur eventually. Um, the assumption is that their pituitary case is going to need surgery. And if it's of recent onset, pituitaries can get really bad really quickly. If they have what's called an apoplexy, so a, like a an infarction within the pituitary, it can, it can like double in size almost instantly. And it's usually very painful, and they, their vision can get completely wiped out in no time at all. So... If it's a very recent onset, that's an emergency. So you need to send them straight to us, um, you know, to our casualty. If, on the other hand, someone's had a long-standing bitemporal defect, well, that's less likely to be an emergency. But I think if if they haven't, if it's not all a known problem, then then I need to see them. And even if it is a known problem, if nobody's following them up, if they've been lost, pituitary tumors always come back eventually. So if if they're if they've been lost to follow up, somebody's going to need to see them, and often it will be me. So, how are we doing for time? I'm sorry, I completely haven't been timing myself at all. <laughs> so we are um, already almost up to fifty minutes. Okay, should we stop there? Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for a very interesting and thought provoking talk. Um, there is one question in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, someone asks if someone is known to have a stroke. 
They yes. then come for an eye test and you find a field defect. Would you refer that patient? Well, Should you refer that patient urgently? Us usually not. I mean, it's difficult, isn't it? Um, if if people had a stroke, the, so the weakness they had or, or, or the, the events that led them to know they had a stroke will usually be on the same side as the field defect. If uh, strokes are so common and older people who are known to have had a stroke have had a workup for a stroke and then go and have an eye test and I found out a field defect is so common, I'm reluctant to suggest that you should refer them all. Um, unless they feel that their vision is in some way worse, in which case I think that would be worth checking. Or if if it's not clear that they ever really got worked up, you know, if, if an eye surgeon told them, oh, you've probably had a stroke, but then nobody's ever, you know, put them on tablets or done anything, that's that's a bit different. So then secondary to that question, refer to neuro-ophthalmology or refer to the stroke clinic by the GP? If you think you've discovered a new stroke that hasn't been worked up by a physician, they should go to the stroke clinic, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. If, I mean, what I mean, the thing is, you know, what we do in neuro-ophthalmology is we do field tests, we do ACTs. We can certainly say, oh, well, we've got this person's fields from two years ago and we can tell you if they're worse or not. Uh, but that's usually not the situation here. Not, usually we, we end up, we know no more about the patient's history than you do as a rule. So it's actually very difficult. I mean, if the, I, I get quite a lot of referrals like this. And if you, you could try the stroke team, but I, I suppose you probably get a feel for how willing your local stroke team are to accept it on the say-so of uh, an optom, because some stroke people are reluctant. Um, you could try, but I, 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 I think unless it's unless there's something, I think I think your likelihood of finding a new problem is pretty low unless there's something to imply a change in their history or some something you found to imply that it wasn't always this way. Okay, thank you. Um, there are no more questions in the chat. I wonder if anyone else has any other questions. Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask or perhaps type in the chat. I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. And then I'm gonna hit um, pause on the record if that's okay. Can I um, just ask regarding strokes? Um, my closest hospital is Queen Mary's, which obviously doesn't have an A&E. Mm -hmm. um, so would we refer to uh, the PRU or would it be better to go to King's? For stroke? Uh, you could do either. Prue has an acute stroke unit, Queen Elizabeth has an acute stroke unit, and King's has a good a stroke, acute stroke unit, so any of those would do. I, I, I tend not to be terribly... Uh, we have a slight problem with Darrant Valley is that although Darrant Valley is a good hospital, it doesn't communicate with any other hospitals, so if the patient goes there, we never know what the outcome was. Uh, but they do have them, and they have good clinicians there. Okay, thank you. Brilliant, okay. So I'm just going to press stop recording.